Hi everyone, and welcome to the 14th week of Introduction to Causal Inference. This week's topic is counterfactuals and mediation. There are roughly two parts to this lecture. The first part will just talk about the basics of counterfactuals, and then in the second part, we will talk about a very important application of these basics, which is mediation analysis. So that's when you want to explain some total causal effect in terms of what portion of it goes through a mediator and what portion of it doesn't go through the mediator. Now let's go ahead and jump straight into the basics of counterfactuals. First, recall the fundamental problem of causal inference that we saw way back in week two. So in this example, you have the choice of either taking a pill or not taking a pill, where taking a pill corresponds to do t equals one, and not taking corresponds to do t equals zero. And you want to know if this pill has a causal effect on your headache. So you start off with a headache, and then if you end up with the outcome y equals one, you no longer have a headache. And if y equals zero, then you still have a headache. The subscript i here denotes that we're talking about a specific individual, so you in this instance. And then the parentheses denotes what treatment we're talking about taking. So y under treatment one. So what is the outcome you would receive if you got treatment one? And what is the outcome you would see if you got treatment zero, if you didn't take the pill? These are potential outcomes. And in this example, we know that y0 is 0 and y1 is 1. In other words, if you take the pill, then you, your headache goes away. And then if you don't take the pill, then you will still have a headache. And then that's how we define the unit level or individual level causal effect, which in this example would be 1. This means that the pill does have an effect on your headache. However, the fundamental problem here is that you can either take the pill or not take the pill. So if you don't take the pill, then you'll be able to observe this outcome on the bottom, y0. That's what we'll call the factual, but you won't be able to observe the potential outcome on the top, which we'll call the counterfactual. And this means that we can't observe the unit level causal effect because we can't observe both potential outcomes. Similarly, if we were to take the treatment, then the bottom one becomes the counterfactual and the top one is the factual. So we would observe after taking the pill that our headache goes away, but we wouldn't be able to observe the counterfactual, what would have happened if we had not taken the pill. So we introduced this fundamental problem way back in week two when we were talking about potential outcomes, but we hadn't seen structural causal models yet. Well, it turns out that with structural causal models, we can compute the counterfactuals if we have a parametric structural causal model. In other words, if we know the specific functional form of the structural equations. We'll first introduce some notation for counterfactuals. So here we have the distribution of y t, the potential outcome that we would observe if we were to take treatment little t. We have this distribution given that we have observed that t takes on the value t prime, a different value from this t and then also an observation for y here. We'll call this stuff behind the conditioning bar the observation, so it's what we have observed. Say for a specific unit, we observed that they took treatment t prime, and they observed outcome y prime. And then we want to know what would have happened had they taken a different treatment. So there's this hypothetical condition that that's what lets us know which potential outcome we're interested in looking at. And this is a counterfactual because this hypothetical condition, little t, does not match the observation that we saw for t, the t prime here. So that's why it's a counterfactual. We've seen expressions that look a bit like this before when we saw conditional average treatment effects, right? So here we have a potential outcome, and then we're conditioning on something. But the difference is that in a counterfactual expression, the observation conflicts with the hypothetical condition, with the potential outcome that we're interested in. Whereas in a conditional average treatment effect, the observation, so here x equals little x, does not conflict with this hypothetical condition. So in other words, we can actually observe the conditional average treatment effect if we are able to run experiments, whereas we can't observe counterfactuals even if we're running experiments. And another way to write this conditional average treatment effect is with the do operator. So with the do operator, we can describe 
data that we would observe under experiments if we were to do little t. However, with counterfactuals, we can't observe them from experiments. That's because the hypothetical condition conflicts with the observation. So because the do operator is notation for telling us what we would see in experiments, we can't actually express counterfactuals using do notation. Okay, so that's a bit about what counterfactuals are, and now I'll give you a very quick roadmap for how we're going to compute these counterfactuals, how we're going to get around the fundamental problem of causal inference. The first thing is we'll have to observe some data. So for example, for a specific person, we observe the treatment and outcome that they had. This corresponds to observing the treatment and the potential outcome y little t, where little t is the specific observed value of big T, right? This is by consistency. Then the main ingredient that we'll need is a parametric model for the structural equation for y. So we'll only be able to get the correct counterfactual if we have a correct parametric model for this structural equation for y. And this is a pretty big ask to have a correct parametric model. We'll see that we don't need it later on if we don't care about unit level or individual level counterfactuals, but for now, by counterfactual we mean the thing at the individual level. For you, would you have gotten a headache had you not taken the treatment? And then with this observation and this correct parametric model, the result is that we can access counterfactuals. So we observed yt, but then we can access the counterfactuals yt prime at the unit level, so for individuals. We'll start with a very simple example. In this example, y corresponds to whether or not a person is happy. So y equals 1 means happy, y equals 0 means unhappy. And the treatment of interest is getting a dog. t equals 1 means getting a dog. t equals 0 means not getting a dog. So we're interested in the causal effect of getting a dog on happiness. And in this example, there are two different types of people, which we'll describe using u, this unobserved variable. So the first type is a dog person, that's u equals 1. And the second type is an anti-dog person, that's u equals 0. Here's the corresponding structural causal model. We don't need a structural equation for t, because t's structural equation is unimportant. It can be whatever. In other words, people can decide whether or not to get a dog to, based on whatever. It doesn't matter. But the structural equation for y is what's important here. So this structural equation tells us that if they're a dog person, so if u is 1, then their happiness will just be equal to the treatment. So if they get a dog, they'll be happy. If they don't get a dog, they won't be happy. And if they're not a dog person, so if u equals 0, then this term will cancel out. And then their happiness will be the opposite of the treatment. So if they don't get a dog, then they'll be happy. And if they do get a dog, then they'll be unhappy. Okay, so that's the setting we're considering in this very simple example. Then we observe that a person does not get a dog and is unhappy. So for this unit, where their big U is equal to little u, we know that when they don't take treatment, they are unhappy. So we know this potential outcome, the y0 potential outcome at the unit level. And we want to know the unit level counterfactual. In other words, what would be this person's happiness if they had gotten a dog? And the main thing we'll use here is this structural equation for y. So we can solve for the specific value of u for this person. And then we'll be able to use that to get their counterfactual. So the first thing is we just take that structural equation. It gives us this equality. Then we plug in the observation. So t equals 0, y equals 0. We plug those in to this equation. Simplifying things down a bit, we have that 0 equals 1 minus u, which tells us that this person's specific value of u is 1. So then since we have u, we can write down this sort of individualized SCM for this person, which is step two. We just plug in one for u in the above SCM. So this structural equation for y simplifies down into y equals t. And then the specific potential outcome that we're interested in is where t equals one. So we just plug in that for the structural equation for t. Then this individualized SCM tells us the potential outcome y1 for this specific unit. This 1 here goes there, and then 
the value of y is just the value of t. So we get one for this potential outcome. Great, so that's it. We've computed this person's counterfactual. And then we could even use this to get their individual treatment effect. What we did on the last slide was a specific example, but there are general steps for this. I take these from chapter four of Proletal's primer. The first step is abduction. So that's where we use an observation for an individual to determine that individual's value of u. Then we can use this to get the person's individualized SCM. Then in the second step, we modify that SCM by replacing the structural equation for t with the little t that we're interested in for that potential outcome that we're interested in. Then in the third step, we use the value of u from step one and the modified SCM from step two to compute the value of the counterfactual. This brings us to our first question of this lecture, which is, given the observation t equals one and y equals zero, compute the counterfactual y zero for this individual given the following SCM. Although we were able to determine the exact value of the counterfactual with probability one in the previous example, we can't always do that. So even if we have the structural equation for y, we can't always determine counterfactuals with probability one. So for the structural equation for y, if it's a function of u and t, and if we fix the value of t, then it's a function from u to y. And we need to be able to invert that function from u to y in order to solve for u from this structural equation for y. As an example, consider this structural equation. Here there are four different values that u could take on. It could take on the usual values that we saw last time, which are the dog hater and dog neater values, in which case the value of y is just equal to the value of t if you're a dog neater, and it's the opposite value of t if you're a dog hater. But here we also have two more values of u. So y could just always take on the value of one. That's for people who are always happy. Or y could always take on the value of zero, regardless of the treatment. So that's for people who are never happy. Then to see why we can't solve for u here, consider a specific observation. So here we get a dog, we def treatment equals one, and then we observe that we're unhappy. So y equals zero. And then we want to solve for u here. We want to know which u this specific unit is. And we can't know. This unit could be either a never happy person or a dog hater, right? We can't uniquely determine the value of u here. Okay, so what do we do in non-invertible examples like this? So in this example, we have the potential outcome under treatment one, and we know that it's equal to zero and we're interested in the potential outcome under treatment zero. What we need to do is write down some sort of prior distribution for u. So in this example, we might have studied the population a bit and have some prior knowledge on them, which we can then encode in these probabilities, right? So 30% of the population is always happy, 20% is never happy, 40% will be happy if they have a dog, unhappy if they don't have a dog, and then the remaining 10% will be unhappy if they have a dog and happy if they don't have a dog. And really, we only needed the probabilities for the never happy and the dog hater groups because those are the potential values of u that this specific unit could be. So in the invertible case, we used this observation to tell us exactly what the value of u is. And in this case, we're going to use the observation to update our distribution of u. So we just apply Bayes' rule here, and we get that the probability that this person is a never happy person is two thirds, and the probability that this person is a dog hater is one third. Okay, so this is gonna be very useful, this new distribution of u, and remember that the thing we're interested in is this counterfactual, y zero. So what would y zero be if this person is a never happy person? Then y zero would be zero, because they're never happy. Y is always gonna be the value of zero. And what would this counterfactual be if this person were a dog hater? Then, because they're not taking the treatment, so t is zero here, then y would be one. 
Okay, so that means that this counterfactual takes on the value of 1 with probability 1 third and takes on the value of 0 with probability 2 thirds. So that's what we get in this example. We don't get the counterfactual with probability 1, right? Not all the probability is concentrated on one value of the counterfactual, but rather we get this distribution for the counterfactual. And there's three general steps for this probabilistic counterfactuals case as well, also taken from chapter four of Pearl's Primer. The first step, instead of being able to uniquely determine the value of u, we just update the distribution of u given some observation z. Then the second step is exactly the same. We just replace the value of t with the specific little t that we're interested in for the counterfactual. And then step three is almost the same in that we're still combining steps one and two, but now we'll get a non-degenerate distribution for the counterfactual. In other words, it'll not place all of the probability on one value for the counterfactual. All right, so we've now seen some pretty cool things, how we can get around the fundamental problem of causal inference, how we can actually infer counterfactuals. But in order to do this, we needed a parametric model for the structural equation for y. Without it, we wouldn't be able to compute these unit level counterfactuals. So when I've been saying counterfactuals so far, I've meant unit level counterfactuals. And having such a parametric model is a pretty strong assumption. But without making this strong assumption, we're stuck with the fundamental problem of causal inference. In other words, we can't observe both unit level potential outcomes. Or in the non-binary treatment case, we can't observe more than one unit level potential outcome. We'll see that we don't need this strong assumption if we don't care about the unit level, but we care about the population level. But first, I have this following question for you. Given the observation t equals 1 and y equals 0, compute the counterfactual y0 for this individual given the following SCM and prior. So we saw that without a parametric model for the structural equation for y, we can't compute counterfactuals at the unit level. But if we care about the population level, then we don't need such a parametric model. So what do I mean by the population level? Now we're not talking about y, u for a specific unit, specific individual. Rather, we're talking about the expectation over the whole population. And it's counterfactual because this t does not match this t prime here. So we've actually seen this before. So we are able to identify the average treatment effect non-parametrically, so not using a parametric model. We are able to identify that using just the causal graph. And we can do the same with population level counterfactual quantities if they're identifiable. And we saw that we could identify conditional average treatment effects with just the causal graph as well. For general identification of counterfactual quantities, see this paper from 2018 by Malinsky et al., where they come up with what they call the potential outcome calculus, which is a generalization of due calculus for identifying counterfactual quantities. Right, so due calculus is for identifying quantities with the due operator in them, which are quantities that are not counterfactual. But you can have a similar calculus for counterfactual expressions, as they do in this paper. Okay, but so the important part of this slide is that we don't need a parametric model to identify counterfactual expressions that are at the population level. And I'll kind of show that to you in basically the most important application of counterfactual analysis, which is mediation. So what is mediation? Say that I know that getting a dog has some causal effect on my happiness, but part of having a dog means walking your dog and having more exercise has an effect on happiness. So I want to know what amount of that effect is just due to walking and what amount of it is due to other stuff related to having a dog. So I might draw a causal graph like this and the causal effect that's not due to walking. So Stuff related to having a dog that affects my happiness that's not due to walking is known as the direct effect. And the amount of happiness from having a dog that's due to walking is known as the indirect effect. So that's mediated by the mediator, the walking mediator there. So this is what mediation analysis is about. We have some potential mediator that we want to know what amount of the total causal effect is going through the mediator and what amount is not going through the mediator. 
For example, if all of the causal effect of getting a dog on my happiness is mediated by just walking more, then I don't really need to get a dog. I could just walk more. In other words, if the indirect effect is the total effect, then there might not be a reason to get a dog. But if there is a large direct effect here, then there might be a reason to get a dog. And the phrase direct effect isn't really the best naming here, but it's commonly used, so that's why I use it here. The reason is that there are, are probably potentially many other mediators that you might be interested in. For example, if you're walking your dog, you might make more friends with people who like dogs, who walk up to you on the street and start talking to you, and that could impact your happiness. And that was all bundled up in direct effect before. And there could always just be many other mediators that are kind of bundled up in direct effect. It might make more sense to think of the direct effect as like the unmediated effect. It's the effect that isn't going through the mediators that you're analyzing. And you can think of the indirect effect as like the mediated effect. What amount of the total effect is mediated by some specific mediator of interest? Okay, so how can we measure these indirect and direct effects? We'll start with the direct effect. So you have this causal graph. And you want to measure just the flow from T to Y. You don't want to measure the causation flowing along this path going through M. What might you do? Well, you could condition on M. So you'd be looking at this quantity on the bottom here. However, conditioning isn't really optimal because conditioning on M could open up other paths. So maybe let's not just condition on M to isolate the direct effect. Really, a better choice is to actually intervene on m. So put m inside of the do operator. Because when we do m, then we remove all incoming edges to m, and then we've effectively isolated the flow of causation from t to y in this graph. Because in this graph, after we've removed edges going into m, we have that the only causation flowing from t to y is directly from t to y, not through m. And this is known as the controlled direct effect, because we're controlling m to be equal to some specific value, little m. But there are some problems with the controlled direct effect. The first is that this CDE is specific to the arbitrary choice of m, right? So for any different value of m here, we can get a different controlled direct effect. Ideally, we would have just one controlled direct effect. In other words, the direct effect would be one specific value, ideally. Then the second major problem is how do we get the indirect effect? So we're not just interested in the direct effect, but also the effect that goes through the mediator M. And you might think that you could subtract the controlled direct effect from the total effect to get the indirect effect. But subtracting the controlled direct effect from the total effect doesn't necessarily give you the indirect effect. Okay, so to solve this problem, we'll consider what's known as the natural direct effect and the corresponding natural indirect effect. First, we have to introduce this subscript notation. So we denote y given do t and m as just y with the subscript t and m. And then there's nothing special about y. We can do the same thing for the mediator. So m given do t is just m sub t. So under this new notation, we could rewrite the control direct effect that we saw in the previous slide as follows. And now we'll introduce the natural direct effect. So with the natural direct effect, we're still intervening on t to set it to 1 and set it to 0, and taking the difference between those two. But the difference between the natural direct effect and the control direct effect comes with the value that we're setting the mediator equal to. So in the natural direct effect, we're setting the mediator equal to the value that it would be under no treatment. So here we're talking about a mediator when the treatment is equal to zero. Same here. In other words, we want to know how the outcome would change when treatment is changed from zero to one when the mediator in both cases is fixed to the specific value that the mediator would be if treatment were zero. So for this expression on the right, everything seems pretty normal in that the treatment is zero here and the treatment is zero here. But for the expression on the left, 
it's much less normal. It's a counterfactual expression. So we're talking about the outcome under treatment one, but then we're talking about the mediator under treatment zero. So this is where the counterfactual is, right? This term is the outcome that we would observe if we take treatment, but then in this world where the mediator is intervened on to set to be equal to the value that the mediator would be if treatment were zero. So this is a direct effect because the mediator is set to the same value in both potential outcomes, while the treatment is varying across the two potential outcomes. And it's natural in the sense that the specific value that the mediator is set to is the value that it would naturally take on under no treatment. This can be a bit intuitive, especially the potential outcome on the left, since it's counterfactual. So I think it's worth kind of pausing here and thinking a bit about this to make sure this makes sense to you. So that's the natural direct effect, and then we can define the natural indirect effect very similarly. Here we want to know the effect of T on Y that's going through the mediator. So the term on the right is still the same. And the term on the left is the counterfactual term, but the term on the left is different now. So because we want to know the effect going through the mediator now, we want the mediator values to be different between the two terms. That's why the first term has the mediator set to the value that it would take on if treatment were 1, and the second term has the mediator set to the value that the mediator would take on if treatment were 0. But we only want to know the effect that's going through the mediator. So we want to set the treatment to be the same value in both cases. So no treatment. So like the fact that the natural direct effect first term was counterfactual, the natural indirect effect first term is counterfactual as well, it's the value of the outcome that we would observe under treatment zero but then in a world where the mediator is set to a value that it would take on under treatment 1. Again, that might be a bit unintuitive, so I think it makes sense to pause here and just think about this a bit for yourself before moving on. Now, recall that the controlled direct effect had two problems. The first is that it had an arbitrary choice of m. And in this natural direct effect and natural indirect effect, we have these natural choices of m. So it's the value that the mediator would take on in the setting where the treatment takes on values that the treatment would normally take on. And the second problem with the controlled direct effect is that we don't know how to get an indirect effect. In other words, we didn't have a way of decomposing the total effect into the direct effect and indirect effect. Well, with the natural direct and natural indirect effects, we do have a way to decompose the total effect into the natural indirect effect and natural direct effect. Here, the natural indirect effect with this subscript R just means the reverse transition. So that means that rather than being interested in what would happen if we went from treatment 0 to treatment 1, we're interested in the other direction. If we went from treatment 1 to treatment 0. So we would take this natural indirect effect expression, and to get this sub r1, we just replace all zeros with ones and all ones with zeros for all of this. For example, in the linear setting, the reversal operator just turns into a negative, and we get this very clean additive decomposition. Total effect is equal to natural direct effect plus natural indirect effect. And that brings us to our next question, which is show that the total effect decomposes as the natural direct effect minus the natural indirect effect in the reverse direction, where this is exactly what I mean by natural indirect effect in the reverse direction. It's worth recapping the strengths and weaknesses of controlled direct effects and natural direct effects and comparing them on the same slide. So the great thing about controlled direct effects is they, they can always be measured via experiments. So you can denote them in terms of just the do operator. You don't need counterfactuals. But 
the bad thing about them is that there's no clear undirect effect, right? And there's no decomposition of the total effect into a direct effect and undirect effect in this controlled version. Whereas with natural direct effects, they can't always be measured via experiments since they're counterfactual. But the natural direct effect allows for the complete decomposition of the total effect into the natural direct effect and natural indirect effect, which is very important in mediation analysis, right? We want to be able to attribute, say, what percentage of the total effect is due to some mediator, is going through that mediator. And though natural direct effect and natural indirect effect can't always be measured via experiments or identified, they can be if we have the right causal graph. So we're not going to talk about when we can measure the natural direct effect and natural indirect effect. First, we have some adjustment set W, and we'll give you some sufficient conditions for identifying the natural direct effect, which you can then use to identify the natural indirect effect via that decomposition. The first one is that no member of W is the descendant of T. The second condition is that W blocks all backdoor paths from M to Y. So if we have these two, then we have the following equation for the natural direct effect. This tells us that we can identify the natural direct effect via experiments if we have these two conditions satisfied. The reason I say via experiments is because there are many do operators in this equation, and we can have access to these interventional distributions with the do operators in them if we are doing experiments that correspond to those do operators, those interventions. But how about identifying the natural direct effect from just observational data? So can we get rid of these do operators? For example, this do operator, we're, we're jointly intervening on T and M, and then we're summing over all M. That seems like a lot of interventions. We have to intervene on M for all values of M. So how can we identify these quantities, get rid of these do operators? Well, we'll need two more assumptions. The first is that we need to be able to identify the distribution of the mediator, given that we've intervened on T and conditional on W. So for example, we can identify this distribution if there are no unblockable backdoor paths from T to M, then we would have identifiability by just the backdoor adjustment. But you could imagine more general identifiability using do calculus. And then the last condition is that we need to be able to identify the distribution of y, given that we jointly intervene on t and m, conditional on w. So for example, if we have no unblockable backdoor paths from t to y, because we're intervening on t, and because since we're also intervening on m, but we've already assumed that we have no backdoor paths from m to y, so if we have this fourth sufficient condition, then we can identify the natural direct effect using just observational data. Here we've just gotten rid of the do operators. And finally, we can use this to identify the natural indirect effect using this decomposition of the total effect. Then the final question is to come up with your own example of mediation and the corresponding causal graph. Then Using that causal graph, see whether you can identify the natural direct effect and natural indirect effect, say from observational data or experimental data, using the sufficient conditions on the last slide. Finally, you might be interested in measuring causal effects that are flowing along arbitrary paths in the graph. So say so you have this total effect of T on Y and you want to measure the effect along one path or along multiple paths, uh, but not all of the paths from T to Y. These are known as path-specific effects. And if you want to learn more about this, you can go ahead and check out this identifiability of path-specific effects paper from 2005. All right, and that's the end of this course on Introduction to Causal Inference. Thanks for sticking through to the end. I hope you enjoyed it.